This morning we're going to consider something that I've been learning a little more about as I've gone along in life, especially now we've moved onto a farm property in southern Australia. And we've had a number of animals, different types of animals on our property, including sheep. This morning we will speak a little bit about feeding the lambs, in meekness, feeding the lambs it's called. We want to understand something that happened in the life of the great apostle Peter. And what he learned and what Jesus asked him to do as a result of his experience. So if you'd like to turn in your Bibles with me. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 26, we find here the experience that the apostle went through. And we'll start reading in verses 31. Matthew 26, verse 31. Jesus said something to all of the disciples here when he said, And all ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Jesus was trying to forewarn his disciples about something that would take place that very night. And he wanted them to be prepared for what was taking place. He says in verse 32, but after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Now, as he says this, how many of them are listening to what Jesus says? In the very next verse, it reveals something. Peter, who was often the first to speak, said, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. I will never. So when Jesus said, all you shall be offended because of me this night, what did Peter do at that moment? As Jesus finished the, what he had just said before, I think Peter wasn't listening anymore. When Jesus said, Peter, you will be offended. You will stumble because of me this night, because of what's going to happen. Peter stopped listening. Do you ever do that? Do you and I ever stop listening when Jesus says something? Do you ever make promises like this? Lord, I will never, never do this. I will never fail you. You ever made a promise like this? Maybe you've stumbled into something a sin, a mistake, but you get back up and you, you promise the Lord, Lord, I will never do this again. You ever made a promise like that? How's it going for you? How's it working out? You know, that's something that's in human nature, and Peter certainly had that. Lord, I will never fail you. I will never leave you. Jesus said unto him in verse 34, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Three times, Peter, Tonight, you're going to deny me. Well, Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise, also said all of the disciples. Everyone said, Lord, we will never leave you. We will never fail you. We will be here. It's a good idea not to argue with Jesus, especially about things that are going to happen in the future. It's a good idea to listen. Well, that lesson was yet to be learned. I'm going to go now to later in the chapter, verses 69 to 75. It happened in between all of these verses that Jesus was arrested in the garden. And all the disciples ran away at that moment, so much for being there with him even until death. But Peter finds himself in the court where Jesus has been taken after he's arrested. And... Peter tries to mix in with the crowd and something happens here that reveals Peter's real character, something inside of him. And so we read from verses 69 to 75. Now Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel came unto him saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all saying, I know not what thou sayest. It happens again. Verse 71, and when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. Do you think at this point that he realizes what he's doing? He's caught up in this situation. He's compromised himself. He's already in this 
mode where he's trying not to be noticed, not to be seen. He's afraid, and twice already he's denied his Lord. And so the third time comes in verses 73 and 74. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. And here Peter does something a little extreme. It says in verse 74, Then began he to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. Peter had gone in this line of compromise to a point that he was willing to deny his Lord by cursing and swearing. But you know something happens in this moment. Something happens there that Peter's heart is touched. He realizes what he's done. He realizes the point that, the lowest point that he's arrived here. He's been going down and down until he's openly, with cursing and swearing, denied Jesus. That he'd promised to stay with faithful unto death. And so it says in verse 75, And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out and wept bitterly. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Lord, I'll never fail you. Lord, I will never do this again. Lord, I will be with you. I will be faithful. And then somewhere along the way, we fall flat of our face. And here was Peter. Here was Peter. And he went out. And I believe he must have gone back to the Garden of Gethsemane. Back to the place where... Jesus had been there just a few hours before, and he was weeping. He went out and he wept bitterly. Peter had to learn something about his character. Was this important for Peter to go through? Was it important that Peter have this kind of experience? Do you think that he needed to have this kind of experience? Well, it depends, doesn't it? Would, Jesus, would, would Peter have had to go through this if he had listened to what Jesus said earlier that night? If he had listened, when Jesus said, you are going to deny me, if Peter had been listening, would he have been prepared for this? So what happens? What does God do when we don't listen? God allows us, when we don't listen, to go through and learn things the hard way. But I think that's human nature. And so something now, after Jesus goes to the cross, he rests in the tomb, he resurrects, and he meets with his disciples... He has an opportunity to talk with Peter later on. And we find this in the book of John. It's recorded in John 21 from verses 15 to 17. There's a conversation that Jesus has with Peter. It says from verse 15, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Jesus had the opportunity to ask Peter a question because Peter had openly denied Jesus with cursing and with swearing and said, I don't even know this man. Jesus now wanted to know from Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, you know, I love you. And Jesus gave him here the commission that we're talking about this morning. When we talk of feeding the lambs, that comes from the apostle Peter and his commission where Jesus says, feed my lambs. That was the first work that Jesus gave to Peter after his deeper conversion. And, of course, Jesus actually asked him the question three times, and I continue verse 16. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. And again it was repeated the third time, he said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. By three times when Jesus asked this question, the third time, Peter was grieved. Why do you think Jesus asked it three times? Three times, do you love me? Why do you think that was? Well, how many times did he deny Jesus? Three times. 
And so three times Jesus wanted to hear, Peter, do you love me? By three times Peter understood Jesus is asking this a little deeper. And all he could say is, Lord, you know everything. You know my heart. You know that I love you. Sometimes we're tempted when we fail. We make those promises that we should never make. Lord, I'll never leave you. I'll be always faithful instead of trusting on him. Lord, I'm going to do this. And then when we fail, sometimes we are tempted to be discouraged and give up. Peter said, Lord, you know my heart. You know why I made that promise, because I do love you. Peter understood his weakness, and he understood he needed to depend on Jesus. And so he, all he could say, he wasn't, he wasn't being so affirmative that, Lord, even though I die, he just said, Lord, you know my heart. You know my heart. You see, he's trusting in Jesus now. Instead of being so sure of himself, he's just trusting in Jesus. There's some lessons we can learn from this experience. I'd like to read to you a little bit from the Desire of Ages on the life of Jesus. Pages 812 to 815 says, The first work that Christ entrusted to Peter on restore him, restoring him to the ministry was to feed the lambs. This was a work in which Peter had little experience. It re required great care and tenderness, much patience and perseverance. You see, Peter did not understand how to be patient with people. Can you imagine the one that says, Lord, even though everybody else will leave you, I will never leave you. Can you imagine somebody like that being patient with people who struggle with things? So Peter wasn't ready to do that. Peter didn't understand. He was not ready to do that. It would require a lot of care, a lot of tenderness, a lot of patience. I've had a sheep on my property, a little lamb. Yes, you need patience with sheep. You really do. And so the first work that Jesus gave him after restoring him, after saying, Peter, I will entrust you with this mission. The first work was to feed the lambs. And there's something about the lambs that need care. I'll just mention, it dawned on me only very recently. We were visiting some friends on another farm in southern Australia, and they had some lambs there that they were feeding. And, you know, it dawned on me something. Why do you need to feed lambs? Why would they need to be fed? It's only, the only lambs that need to be fed are the ones that are orphans. Those are the lambs that you have to feed because the other lambs are fed by their mothers. So we're talking when Peter was commissioned to feed the lambs, it illustrates the people who need the most help, the most care, the most sympathy, because without you, they would die. Without some care, they have no hope for the future. And this is the very most important work that the Lord gives to Peter and to his church. The statement here goes on, on in Desire of Ages. Heretofore, Peter had not been fitted to do this or even to understand its importance. But this was the work which Jesus now called upon him to do. For this work, his own experience of suffering and repentance had prepared him. There's something about when you go through pain and you go through suffering, it prepares you to feel for other people. I've experienced this personally, and I realized it first. I realized the benefit of going through suffering yourself for the first time, I believe, when I went... I was traveling overseas. I went to a place and I met a little fella named Moses. Moses, this was a few years ago, so Moses was probably about 12 or 13 years old now, but he was about seven years old. Little Moses is unable to speak. He's unable to, because of muscle tone, he's unable to hold himself up properly. He's unable to feed himself, and so his parents were there caring for him. But going through experiences in my own life, uh, in my own family, I could understand. And so I know that there was a time in my life when I didn't know how to, how to relate to people with disabilities and people who had problems, and I didn't know what to do, you know. If you have never had any problems yourself, you feel like, what's your problem? What? And you just don't know what to do. But I found myself going 
up to Moses and his parents and just surrounding them with a big hug and saying, God bless you. And there's really nothing much else that you can do, but there's something that you feel inside. There's something that changes in here. And that same thing has helped me when I have church members who are struggling with problems and things. Rather than just coming down on them like a ton of bricks, you actually go and you find out what's going on. What's the matter? And what can we do to get you from point A to B? Back to word where you need to be. And so Peter was prepared to feed the lambs after he himself had gone through the experience that he did and realizing his own weakness and his own need. And so, in fact, that's what it says in the next sentence. In Desire of Ages, <clears throat> he, remembering his own weakness and failure, Peter was to deal with his flock as tenderly as Christ had dealt with him. This is an experience that all of us need. There is something that we need to do practically, and I'll spend just a moment on it briefly, because sheep... and lambs particularly, the first work that was given to Peter was to feed the lambs. What does a lamb grow up to be? A little lamb who needs all this help and care grows up, and what does it grow up to be? You know, you have people in your congregations who are young or young in the faith. They're just there. They have a lot of needs. They're not where they need to be. They're not mature, but they will grow up, and what will they grow up to be? They will grow up to be, you know, the lambs now will be the leaders in the future. They will be the sheep of the future. And so Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 19, he said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. We need to realize that the ones who need the most help are the ones who will do the most in the future. Jesus' work in Isaiah 40 was... Spelled out in Isaiah 40, verse 11, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. There's an important work upon the church, important work for us to do. We're told in places like councils on Sabbath school work that the Lord is not glorified when the children are neglected and passed by. They're to be educated, disciplined, and patiently instructed. They require more than casual notice, more than a word of encouragement. They need painstaking, careful, prayerful labor. Our young people need our help. Our young people need us to do something for them. And it needs to be more than has been, more than hit and miss. You know, we know the, the statement that about the greatest want of the world. The greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. We need young people like this. And we say to ourselves, where are they? Where are these kind of young people? But you know, it goes on to say that a character like this is not something that you just get by accident. Such a character is not the result of accident. It is not due to special favors or endowments of providence. A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self for the service of love to God and man. People do not develop this kind of character by random chance, by just absorption. This is something that takes discipline and work and they need help to do that. A lamb is not able to mature on its own. If you don't help a lamb, it will not survive. And so, as a church, and as individuals, if we would stand clear in the judgment, we must make more liberal efforts for the training of our young people. This is a work that we must do. Some people would be content with the thorough education of a few of the most promising of our youth, but they all need an education that they may be fitted for usefulness in this life qualified for places of responsibility in both private and public life. Across the board, among everyone who knows the third angel's message, this has always been a problem, and it still is. And it will be until we will have a different order of things among us. 
Finally, to this morning, I just want to bring something else to your attention as we come back to the point of the lesson of the Apostle Peter, the lesson which he learned. He writes now in, as he's gone through years of ministry after the experience that he went through, he writes in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The Apostle Peter challenges us here, if we want to be successful in ministry, this is what we need to do. The first thing is to sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. You need to make room for Jesus and not just make room because it says sanctify, make him holy and number one in your heart. In order for you and I to be successful in working for others, we need to make 100% room for Jesus in our heart. Until we do that, we are not ready for the Holy Spirit to work through us completely. Then it says, and be ready always to give an answer. And how many of us have been ready to sharpen the sword and ready to use that sword to give an answer, to, to perhaps debate with someone or win an argument. But here it says to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And the only way you'll do that is when you yourself understand your need when you come to the foot of the cross like Peter did. And so I want to leave you with a little statement here that says in Acts of the Apostles, page 551, the completeness of Christian character. And here it's important. When it talks about complete Christian character, wouldn't you want to know what exactly is that? What is completeness of Christian character? Well, it says the completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. It is the atmosphere of this love surrounding the soul of the believer that makes him a savor of life unto life and enables God to bless his work. Do you want God to bless your work for him? When our hearts are so in tune with Jesus, so emptied of ourself and self-confidence that the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within, then that is when we have attained the kind of character that Jesus related in the world. And that's the kind of character that the world is waiting to see today. So may the Lord bless us that we will learn through experiences, whether we listen to Jesus in the first place or whether we have to go through hard experiences, that we will learn how to care for other people and be able in meekness to feed the lambs. May God bless you this morning. Amen.